Lessons Tactics mini lecture. So in the prior pages of the module, we introduced power and what it means to have power. And then we identified two different ways that individuals can acquire power. So they can acquire power either through their position in the organization or through um, personal types of power made by uh, forming connections with other individuals. So now what we're gonna do is transition into talking about influence. And by definition, influence is the use of an actual behavior that causes behavioral or attitudinal changes in others. So essentially, individuals in power can influence other, uh, other people and can affect the way they behave in the workplace. So we are going to introduce 10 different influence tactics uh, that can be used in order to try to change or shape someone else's behaviors or attitudes. So we're going to start, we're going to break this up. Like I said, there are 10 tactics. We're going to um, focus on these first four. So the first one is called rational persuasion. And this occurs when we try to influence another person through logical arguments and using hard facts. So in this case, uh, perhaps you want to convince your boss of investing in some new equipment. You might um, gather some facts and figures about how much money they'll save in the future um, or in the long run if they switch to this new system. Uh, so by providing data and um, relying on logical arguments, that can help influence somebody's attitude or behavior. In particular, rational persuasion is very effective for um, influencing people who are at higher levels than us. So if you want to convince your boss or if you wanted to convince somebody in power um, to make a change, uh, this persuasion, uh, this rational persuasion would be your best your best route. So for instance, imagine that students in this class wanted to stop taking quizzes. Uh, perhaps they could put together some information about statistics of how quizzes are harmful for students. Um, if you were trying to convince me to get rid of quizzes, using that type of logical argument by showing evidence and data to support your idea would be um, the most effective strategy. Uh, but don't get any ideas because we only have a few quizzes left, so we're, we're in it for the long haul. The second influence tactic is called consultation. Uh, and this occurs when the person who is trying to influence someone else goes to that person and asks them how they think a task should be carried out. So imagine that your organization wants to implement a dress code policy and they don't already have a dress code policy. In this instance, the leader would go to the employees and ask them about the dress code, how they feel about it, if they had a dress code, what kind of uniform they would like to wear, would be comfortable wearing. Um, so in this instance, asking individuals for their participation and for their insight uh, is really helpful in getting them to eventually buy in and change their behaviors in the long run. Uh, so this is going to really increase commitment. And you'll see that this is um, really a theme that we've had throughout the semester. If you think back to even goal setting theory, uh, when we ask for in, you know, insight, when we ask for participation from our employees and we allow them an opportunity to have voice, it increases their commitment and buy into our changes. So if we gave employees an opportunity to have a say about what a dress code could or would be like, uh, then they're more likely to go along with those changes when they're actually made. The third type of influence tactic is called an inspirational appeal. And this uh, is basically what it sounds like. It's when we appeal to the person's values and ideals. So we're really going for an emotional reaction here. So um, you'll see this a lot of times with political candidates where they try to talk about a shared set of values and ideals and um, try to really get people either angry or hopeful, right? They're trying to target a specific emotional reaction that's going to bring people um, on board to, to follow along with what they've suggested. 
Now it's really important that if you're going to use this approach that you actually know the target's values, right? So if you're trying to appeal to their values, uh, but you're wrong about what their values are, then this strategy is not going to be effective. The final um, influence tactic is called collaboration. And this occurs when uh, the person who's doing the influencing, um, they try to make it easier for the target person to complete the request. So what this means is they might offer help or support or resources uh, that make it easier for the person to say yes to whatever it is they want them to do. Uh, and I'll give you an example of this. When I um, was just out of college, I worked at a Holiday Inn doing sales and um, one day it snowed a lot. So there's a ton of snow on the ground and all of us managers wanted to stay home for the day. And our general manager did not want that. She wanted us to come to work. And so she had a car that had four wheel drive and she felt very comfortable driving and basically said, if you don't feel comfortable driving to work, I will come pick you up for work. So in this case, uh, it was very hard to say, no, I can't come to work because um, here she is offering a support or a resource to make it easier for you to do what she wanted, which was come to work. So um, in this case, if your boss wants you to complete uh, a big report and you don't want to complete the report, they might offer you, um, you know, oh, I'll pay you overtime or I'll buy you dinner while you're working on it or I'll let you have an administrative assistant to help you. All of these are resources that could be provided to make it easier to just comply with what your boss would want. So again, collaboration uh, is when the person who's doing the influencing tries to help complete the task or tries to remove obstacles or increase resources that basically makes it easier for the target to complete the request. So these four influence tactics are described first uh, because <clears throat> in general, uh, these are going to take advantage of personal forms of power. So in each of these situations, um, an individual is trying to convince somebody to do something and generally can be successful if they have that personal relationship and are respected by other people. These four influence tactics are also the most effective influence tactics. So we are going to describe six more influence tactics on the following pages uh, that can be effective, but they depend on the situation. So um, in general, these four are going to be the most effective. We also call these soft tactics. So um, again, you won't see any sort of bribery or um, you know, any kind of rewards being offered here or anyone trying to coerce anyone to do anything. These are just ways to try to influence people's behavior by giving them reasoned arguments, by seeking their input, by speaking to their values, and by trying to help them. So we would consider these more soft tactics in trying to change behavior. So now we'll go through the remaining influence tactics. Um, and so you'll see that on the left, we'll describe three tactics that are gonna be moderately effective, uh, and then three tactics that are gonna be less effective um, for changing behavior and then getting those behaviors to sustain over time. So the first moderately effective strategy is called ingratiation. Uh, and this is basically when we use favors or compliments or, or very friendly behavior that might be over the top uh, in order to change someone's mind. So kind of in a very informal way, we might call this sucking up to someone. So if you go into your boss and you say, oh my gosh, your leadership style is just so great. I'm so lucky to be able to learn from you. Thank you for being so wonderful. Um, that would be considered ingratiation, particularly if you wanted something and or if you weren't being sincere in what you were saying. So um, this is really considered only moderately effective uh, because especially in the short term, you might be able to see through somebody's strategy. So um, for instance, if you wrote me an email and said, Dr. Fulmer, you're just the best professor I ever had. Thanks so much for being great. 
And then in the next sentence said, and by the way, can I just not do the final project? <laughs> uh, it's not effective to give somebody favors or compliments and then immediately ask for something. So the long-term strategy is that you sort of have to suck up to them and give them all these compliments for a long period of time and then, um, uh, and then ask for something later. The second strategy that's moderately effective is called personal appeals. And this is when someone will ask someone else to do something based on friendship or loyalty. So assume that you are working with a coworker and they want you to take their shift for them this weekend uh, because they suddenly have a conflict. So they might come to you and say, I really need you to work for me this weekend. I'm not asking as a coworker. I'm really asking you as a friend. Please help me out as a friend. Uh, and you might even have experience making these kind of appeals. So um, this strategy is really only going to be effective for strong friendships or relationships. So if you say to somebody, I'm asking as your friend, and you just met them, uh, they're going to tell you we're not friends, right? Or that might be perceived as kind of um, odd or inappropriate. So these appeals are helpful, again, for people we know. And they're going to be helpful if used sparingly. So every time you want something, if you ask the same person over and over, you know, to do something for you as a friend, uh, that strategy is going to wear off and it's not going to be as effective. The third strategy that's moderately effective is called apprising. And this is when someone will clearly explain why performing the request or doing that behavior benefits the target personally. So in this case, they're not actually getting anything from you. You're just reminding them of all the benefits that uh, they might get. So for instance, I had a friend that was in a relationship with somebody that was not a really good person and they had a lot of relationship problems. So uh, myself and a few others were frequently trying to convince this person of why she needed to break up with her partner and why they maybe weren't well suited. And so a lot of our explanations, hind you know, kind of hinged on this idea of you'll be so much better off without him. You are such a great person. He's just dragging you down. Think of, think of what life would be like without him and how much better off you'll be. This is a form of apprising because we aren't actually giving her anything, just trying to tell her what she might gain uh, if she listened to us and broke up with this person. Uh, you might also consider if you had an employee and you were asking them to um, work overtime in the weekend and they didn't want to, you could just say, well, this is going to be a great way for you to gain some extra experience and really help out the team and um, you know, you'll be able to talk about this in future career, you know, interviews of ways that you're a really good team player. So you're trying to get someone to do something by just telling them how it's going to benefit them personally. In terms of least effective strategies, there are three. The first is pressure. So this is when uh, somebody tries to get someone else to do something through coercive power, um, through threats and demands. So if, for instance, um, your boss says, I want you to work overtime this weekend, and if you don't, I'm going to fire you, that would be considered an influence tactic, um, but maybe not very effective, um, particularly because this might make some changes in the short term, but it's certainly not going to lead to long-term changes. So maybe, um, for instance, your boss might tell you to um, stop using your cell phone or they're going to fire you. Well, if they tell you that over and over, it might lose um, its value over time. And so maybe one or two times you stop using your phone, but eventually it kind of wears off. The second kind of influence tactic uh, that's considered least effective is a coalition. And so this occurs when people form a group in order to help influence the target. So rather than just one person trying to um, change someone's mind or change their behavior, they get several people. So again, imagine that you didn't want to do the final project um, instead of just one student emailing me and saying, I don't wanna do the project. If 10 students email me and try to use the project or tried to get out of the project, um, that would be a form of coalition where you show like this, um, this group that's banded together, uh, a united front in order to try to get change.
generally speaking, coalitions are used in combination with another tactic. So you can think about employees that are threatening to go on strike, uh, have formed a coalition, and they're using a pressure technique. Um, but employees could all form into a group and try to use ingratiation, where the entire group um, compliments or sucks up to the person in charge. And then the last is called exchange, and this occurs when we offer a reward or a resource in return for performing a request. So if we get somebody to do something, but we offer them a reward. So I'll pay you if you just write my report for me, right, uh, would be considered an influence tactic. Again, this might work uh, once or twice, but over time, maybe that reward or resource um, could wear off and maybe it's not really worth it. And also, um, this could be perceived as bribery or coercion, and people don't really like to be manipulated or misled. Uh, and so over time, if this were your go-to strategy, it might not be received favorably by others. So I want you to just think to yourself for a minute of when managers might need to use influence tactics um, in the workplace. And you might see from some of the examples I've already given you that influence tactics can be quite helpful, uh, perhaps for getting an employee to apply for a different position, maybe getting an employee to uh, follow a dress code, listen to a policy, um, even just trying to get employees to get along with one another. Um, all of these are reasons why a manager might need to use influence tactics. So anytime there's a change in policy or procedure, we have to get employees on board and we need to make sure that it changes their behaviors um, in the workplace. So using these influence tactics is really helpful for pushing forward change and um, uh, new policies. So how might these tactics affect employees' reactions? Well, we know from research that uh, depending on the tactic we use, it's going to influence employees' attitudes and it's also gonna influence their behaviors. Uh, and this can happen in both positive and negative ways. So it can make us have better attitudes, it can make us have poor attitudes, uh, it can make us have you know, good behaviors or poor behaviors. So in particular, there are three different ways uh, that we can respond to influence techniques or tactics. So the first is called internalization. This occurs when the target agrees with what we're asking and becomes committed to the request. So here we see them engaging in behavioral um, change and attitudinal change. So they're on board with and want to make the changes and so they do. The second is called compliance. So this occurs when our person is willing to perform the request, so they make the required change, uh, but they do so with indifference. So maybe they don't see it as important and they um, are doing it but don't think it's necessary. So consider right now, um, individuals have to wear masks. It is a state law, it is a law of the university. Um, so here, individuals might wear the mask, so we're seeing some behavioral change, but some individuals might not think it's important, so we're missing that attitudinal change as well. So we, they're going along with the behavior, but maybe not because they want to or not because they think it's a good idea. And the final way that we could respond to an influence tactic is through resistance, and this is what we definitely don't want among employees. Um, so this happens when our a uh, person we're trying to influence is completely opposed to what we're asking, and not only do they think it's a bad idea, but they don't change their behavior. So they push back and resist making any changes. So you can see um, that we can actually map these behaviors back to the specific types of influence tactics we used. So internalization is going to occur when individuals use those tactics that we deemed most effective. Uh, so rational persuasion, consultation, emotional appeals, and consultation. All of those are going to get people to not only change their behaviors, but change their attitudes. Uh, the least effective strategies we talked about, you using pressure, um, exchange, using um, coercion, all of that is going to lead to resistance. So if we use those tactics over time, people are going to think, 
that what we're asking them to do is not a good idea, and then they might not even go along with it. So the reason we say some tactics are most effective and we recommend using them is because it does lead to the best outcomes where people change their behaviors and they have positive attitudinal changes as well. Okay, so um, in the module pages that come, we're going to talk about um, how leaders use their power and influence. So to, to, so far, we've talked about different types of power. We talked about these influence tactics, um, which is a way that we can sort of use our power in order to get other people to do what we want them to do. Um, but then we can put these two things together uh, and tie them back to other organizational um, phenomenon. So in the pages that follow, we're going to talk about organizational politics and what role power and influence plays in that, as well as conflict resolution. So how we can use power and influence in order to resolve conflicts either effectively or ineffectively. So that's our mini lecture for the week. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And I hope you uh, have fun going through the rest of these slides as we get into politics and conflict resolution. Have a great week.